I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which acknowledged women's right to vote in the U.S. This past week, Fairbanks attorneys and Rotarians Joe Cookley and Barbara Schumann spoke to our First City Rotary Club about the long fight for women's suffrage and some of the heroes of that movement. And that reminded me of a small book that I read several years ago by Frances Willard. Frances Willard was one of the heroes of the suffrage movement. She was born in upstate New York in 1839, and she spent her life fighting for social causes, including temperance and women's suffrage. In 1895, she published a little book called A Wheel Within a Wheel, about learning to ride a bicycle at age 53. So I'm going to read an excerpt from the beginning of that book. Preliminary. From my earliest recollections and up to the ripe age of 53, I had been an active and diligent worker in the world. This sounds absurd, but having almost no toys except such as I could manufacture, my first plays were but the outdoor work of active men and women on a small scale. Born with an inveterate opposition to staying in the house, I very early learned to use a carpenter's kit and a gardener's tools and followed in my mimic way the occupations of the poulterer and the farmer, working my little field with a wooden plow of my own making and felling saplings with an ax rigged up from an old iron of the wagon shop. Living in the country, far from the artificial restraints and conventions by which most girls are hedged from the activities that would develop a good physique, and endowed with the companionship of a mother who let me have my own sweet will, I ran wild until my 16th birthday, when the hampering long skirts were brought with their accompanying corset and high heels. My hair was clubbed up with pins, and I remember writing in my journal and the first heartbreak of a young, young human colt taken from its pleasant pasture. Altogether, I recognize that my occupation is gone. From that time on, I always realized and was obedient to the limitations thus imposed, though in my heart of hearts, I felt their unwisdom even more than their injustice. My work then changed from my beloved and breezy outdoor world to the indoor realm of study, teaching, writing, speaking, and went on almost without a break or pain until I reached my 53rd year, when the loss of my mother accentuated the strain of this long period in which my mental and physical life were out of balance, and I fell into a mild form of what is called nerve wear by the patient and nervous prostration by the lookers-on. Thus ruthlessly thrown out of the usual lines of reactions on my environment and sighing for new worlds to conquer, I determined that I would learn the bicycle. An English naval officer had said to me, after learning it himself, you women have no idea of the new realm of happiness which the bicycle has opened to us men. Already I knew well enough that tens of thousands who could never afford to own, feed, and stable a horse had by this bright invention enjoyed the swiftness of motion, which is perhaps the most fascinating feature of material life, the charm of a wild, wide outlook upon the natural world, and that sense of mastery, which is probably the greatest attraction in horseback riding. But the steed that never tires and is meddlesome in the fullest sense of the word, is full of tricks and capers, and to hold his head steady and make him prance to suit you is no small accomplishment. I had often mentioned in my temperance writings that the bicycle was perhaps our strongest ally in winning young men away from the public houses, because it afforded them a pleasure far more enduring and an exhilaration as much more delightful as the natural is to the unnatural. From my observation of my own brother and hundreds of young men who have been my pupils, I have always held 
that a boy's heart is not set in him to do evil any more than a girl's, and that the reason our young men fall into evil ways is largely because we have not had the wit and wisdom to provide them with amusements suited to their joyous youth, by means of which they could invest their superabundant animal spirits in ways that should harm no one and help themselves to the best development in the cleanliest ways of living. So as a temperance reformer, I always felt a strong attraction toward the bicycle because it is a vehicle of so much harmless pleasure and because the skill required in handling it obliges those who mount to keep clear heads and steady hands. Nor could I see a reason in the world why a woman should not ride the silent steed so swift and blithesome. I knew perfectly well that when, some 10 or 15 years ago, Miss Bertha von Hillern, a young German artist in America, took it into her head to give exhibitions of her skill in riding the bicycle. She was thought by some to be a sort of semi-monster. And liberal as our people are in their views of what a woman may undertake, I should certainly have felt compromised at that remote and benighted period by going to see her ride. Not because there was any harm in it, but solely because of what we call in homely phrase, the speech of people. But behold, it was long ago conceded that women might ride the bicycle. Indeed, one had been presented to me by my friend, Colonel Pope of Boston, a famous manufacturer of these swift roadsters as far back as 1886. And I had swung around the garden paths upon its saddle a few minutes every evening when work was over at my rest cottage home. I had even hoped to give an impetus among conservative women to this new line of physical development and outdoor happiness. But that is quite another story and will come in later. Suffice it for the present that it did me good, as it doth the upright in heart, to notice recently that the princesses Louise and Beatrice both ride the tricycle at Balmoral. For I know that with the great mass of feminine humanity, this precedent will have exceeding weight. And where the tricycle prophecies the bicycle shall ere long preach the gospel of outdoors. For we are all unconsciously the slaves of public opinion. When the hansom first came on London streets, no woman having regard to her social state and standing would have dreamed of entering one of these pavement gondolas unless accompanied by a gentleman as her escort. But in course of time, a few women of stronger individuality than the average ventured to go unattended. Later on, you swore off the glamour of the traditions which said that women must not go alone, and now none but an imbecile would hold herself to any such observance. A trip around the world by a young woman would have been regarded a quarter of a century ago as equivalent to social outlawry. But now young women of the highest character and talent are employed by leading journals to whip around the world on time. And one has done so in 73, another in 74 days. While the young women recently sent out by an Edinburgh newspaper will no doubt considerably contract these figures. As I have mentioned, Fräulein von Hillern was, is the first woman, so far as I know, who ever rode a bicycle. And for this, she was considered to be one of those persons who classified nowhere and who could not do so except to the injury of the feminine guild with which they were connected before they stepped out. But now in France, for a woman to ride a bicycle is not only good form, but the current craze among the aristocracy. Since Balaam's Beast, there has been but little authentic talking done by the four-footed. But that is no reason why the two-wheeled should not speak its mind. And the first utterance I have to chronicle in the softly flowing vocables of my bicycle is to the following purport. I heard it as we trundled off down Priory Incline at the suburban home of Lady Henry Somerset, Rygate, England. It said, Behold, I do not fail you. I am not a skittish beastie, but a sober, well-conducted roadster. I did not ask you to mount or drive, but since you have done so, you must now learn the laws of balance and exploitation. 
I did not invent these laws, but I have been built conformably to them. And you must suit yourself to the unchanging regulations of gravity, general and specific, as illustrated in me. Strange as the paradox may seem, you will do this best by not trying to do it at all. You must make up what you are pleased to call your mind. Make it up speedily, or you will be cast in yonder, yonder mud puddle. And no blame to me, and no thanks to yourself. Two things must occupy your thinking powers to the exclusion of every other thing. First, the goal. And second, the momentum requisite to reach it. Do not look down like an imbecile upon the steering wheel in front of you. That would be about as wise as for a nauseated voyager to keep his optical instruments fixed upon the rolling waves. It is the curse of life that nearly everyone looks down. But the microscope will never set you free. You must glue your eyes to the telescope forever and a day. Look up and off and on and out. Get forehead and foot into line, the latter acting as a rhythmic spur in the flanks of your equilibrated equine. So shall you win, and that right speedily. It was divinely said that the kingdom of God is within you. Some make a mysticism of this declaration, but it is hard common sense. For the lesson you will learn from me is this. Every kingdom over which we reign must first be first formed within us on what the psychic people called the astral plane. But what I as a bicycle look upon as the common parade ground of individual thought. The Process. Courtiers wittily say that horseback riding is the only thing in which a prince is apt to excel, for the reason that the horse never flatters and would as soon throw him as if he were a groom. Therefore, it is only by actually mastering the art of riding that a prince can hold his place with the noblest of the four-footed animals. Happily, there is now another locomotive contrivance which is no flatterer, and which peasant and prince must master if they do this at all, by the democratic route of honest hard work. Well will it be for rulers when the tough old Yorkshire proverb applies to them as strictly as to the lowest of their subjects. It's dogged as does it. We all know the old saying, fire is a good servant but a bad master. This is equally true of the bicycle. If you give it an inch, nay, a hair, it will take an L, nay, an evolution, and you a contusion, or like enough, a perforated kneecap. Not a single friend encouraged me to learn the bicycle, except an active-minded young school teacher, Miss Luther, of my hometown, Evanston, who came several times with her wheel and gave me lessons. I also took a few lessons in a stuffy, semi-subterranean gallery in Chicago. But at 53, I was at more disadvantage than most people. For not only had I the impedimenta that results from an unnatural style of dress, but I also suffered from the sedentary habits of a lifetime. And then that small world, which is our real one, of those who loved me best, and who considered themselves largely responsible for my everyday methods of life, did not encourage me. But in their affectionate solicitude, and with abundant reason, thought I should break my bones and spoil my future. It must be said, however, to their everlasting praise, that they opposed no objection when they saw that my will was firmly set to do this thing. On the contrary, they put me in the way of carrying out my purpose, and lent to my laborious lessons the light of their countenances reconciled. Actions speak so much louder than words, that I here set before you what may be a feminine bicycler's first position. At least it was mine. Given a safety bicycle, pneumatic tires and all the rest of it, which renders the pneumatic safety the only safe bucephalus, the gearing carefully wired in so that we shall not be entangled. Woe is me, was my first exclamation, naturally enough interpreted by my outriders. Woe is me. And they woed. Indeed, we did little else but check up. Just let me here interpolate. Learn on a low machine, 
but fly high once you've mastered it, as you have much more power over the wheels and can get up a better speed with a less expenditure of force when you are above the instrument than when you are at the back of it. And remember, this is true of the world as of the wheel. The order of evolution was something like this. First, three young Englishmen, all strong-armed and accomplished bicyclers, held the machine in place while I climbed timidly into the saddle. Second, two well-disposed young women put all the power they had until they grew red in the face, offsetting each other's pressure on the crossbar and thus maintaining the equipoise to which I was unequal. Third, one walked beside me, steadying the arc as best she could by holding the center of the deadly crossbar, to let go of whose handles meant chaos and collapse. After this, I was able to hold my own as if I had the moral support of my kind trainers, and it passed into a proverb among them, the short emphatic word of command I gave them at every few turns of the wheel. Let go, but stand by. Still later, everything was learned, how to sit, how to pedal, how to turn, how to dismount. But alas, how to vault into the saddle I found not. That was the coveted power that lingered long and would not yield itself. That which caused the many failures I had in learning the bicycle had caused me failures in life, namely a certain feel fearful looking for of judgment, a too vivid realization of the uncertainty of everything about me, an underlying doubt at once, however, and this is all that saved me, matched and overcome by the determination not to give in to it. The best gains that we make come to us after an interval of rest which follows strenuous endeavor. Having, as I hoped, mastered the rudiments of bicycling, I went away to Germany and for a fortnight did not even see the winsome wheel. Returning, I had the horse brought round and mounted with no little trepidation, being assisted by one of my faithful guides. But behold, I found that in advancing, turning, and descending, I was much more at home than when I had last to exercise that new intelligence in the muscles which had been the result of repetitions resolutely attempted and practiced long. Another thing I found is that we carry in the mind a picture of the road. And if it is humpy by reason of pebbles, even if we steer clear of them, we can by no means skim along as happily as when its smoothness facilitates the pleasing impression of, on the retina. Indeed, the whole science and practice of the bicycle is in your eye and in your will. The rest is mere manipulation. As I have said, in many curious particulars, the bicycle is like the world. When it had thrown me painfully once, which was the extent of my downfalls during the entire process of learning, it did not prevent me from resuming my place on the back of the treacherous creature a few minutes afterwards, and more especially when it threw one of my dearest friends, hurting her knee so that it was painful for a month. Then for a time Gladys had glad some ways for me no longer, but seemed the embodiment of misfortune and dread. Even so, the world has often seemed in hours of darkness and despondency. Its iron mechanism, its pitiless grind, its swift, silent, on-rolling gait have oppressed to pathos, if not to melancholy. Good health and plenty of oxygenated air have promptly restored the equilibrium. But how many a fine spirit, to finest issues touched, has been worn and shredded by the world's mill until in desperation it flung itself away? We can easily carpet those who quit the crowded race course without so much as saying, by your leave. But let him thinketh, he standeth, take heed lest he fall. We owe it to nature, to nurture, to our environments, and most of all to our faith in God, that we too do not cry like so many gentle hearts less brave and sturdy, anywhere, anywhere out of the world. Gradually, item by item, I learned the location of every screw and spring, spoke and tire, and every beam and bearing that went to make up glass. This was not the lesson of a day, but of many days and weeks, and it had to be learned before we could get on well together. 
To my mind, the infelicities of which we see so much in life grow out of lack of time and patience thus to study and adjust the natures that have agreed in the sight of God and man to stand by one another to the last. They will not take the pains. They have not enough specific gravity to balance themselves in their new environment. Indeed, I found a whole philosophy of life in the wooing and winning of my bicycle. Just as a strong and skillful swimmer takes the waves, so the bicycler must learn to take such waves of mental impression as the passing of a gigantic hay wagon, the sudden obtrusion of black cattle with wide branching horns, the rattling pace of a high stepping steeds, or even the swift transit of a railway crane. At first she will be upset by the apparition of the smallest poodle and not until she has attained a wide experience will she hold herself steady in presence of the critical eyes of a coach and four. But all this is a part of that equilibrium of thought and action by which we conquer the universe in conquering ourselves. I finally concluded that all failure was from a wobbling will rather than a wobbling wheel. I felt that indeed the will is the wheel of the mind. It's per Perpetual motion having been learned when the morning stars sang together. When the wheel of the mind went well, then the rubber wheel hummed merrily. But specters of the mind there are as well as of the wheel. In the aggregate of perception concerning which we have reflected and from which we have deduced our generalizations upon the world without, within, above, there are so many ghastly and fantastical images that they must obtrude themselves at certain intervals, like filmy bits of glass in the turn of the kaleidoscope. Probably every accident of which I had heard or read in my half century tinged the uncertainty that by the correlation of forces passed over into the tremor that I felt when we began to round the terminus bend of the broad priory walk. And who shall say by what original energy the mind forced itself at once from the contemplation of disaster and thrust into the very movement of the foot on the pedal a concept of vigor, safety, and success. I began to feel that myself plus the bicycle equaled myself plus the world, upon whose spinning wheel we all must learn to ride or fall into the sluice ways of oblivion and despair. That which made me succeed with the bicycle was precisely what had gained me a measure of success in life. It was the hardihood of spirit that led me to begin, the persistence of will that held me to my task, and the patience that was willing to begin again when the last stroke had failed. And so I found high moral uses in the bicycle and can commend it as a teacher without pulpit or creed. He who succeeds, or to be more exact in handing over my experience, she who succeeds is gaining the mastery of such an animal as Gladys will gain the mastery of life and by exactly the same methods and characteristics. One of the first things I learned was that unless a forward impetus were given within well-defined intervals, away we went into the gutter, rider and steed. And I said to myself, it is the same with all reforms. Sometimes they seem to lag then they barely balance, then they begin to oscillate as if they would lose the track and tumble to one side. But all they need is a new impetus at the right moment on the right angle, and away they go again mer as merrily as if they had never threatened to stop at all. On the castle terrace, we went through a long, narrow curve in a turret to seek a broader ex esplanade. As we approached, I felt it wrought up in my mind, a little uncertain in my motions, and for that reason, on a small scale, my quick imagination put before me pictures of a standing from under on the part of the machine and damaging bruises against the pitiless walls. But with a little unobtrusive guiding by one who knew better than I how to do it, we soon came out of the dim passage onto the broad, bright terrace we sought, and in an instant my fears were as much left behind as if I had not had them. So it will be, I think, I hope, nay, I believe, when, children that we are, we tremble on the brink and fear to launch away, 
but we shall find that death is only a bend in the river of life that sets the current heavenward. One afternoon on the terrace at East Nor Castle, the most delightful bicycle gallery I have found anywhere, I fell to talking with a young companion about New Year's resolutions. It was just before Christmas, but the sky was of that moist blue that England only knows, and the earth almost steamy in the mild sunshine, while the soft outline of the famous Malvern Hills was restful as the little lake just at our feet, where swans were sailing or anchoring according to their fancy. One of us said, I have already chosen my motto for 1894, and it is this, from a teacher who so often said to her pupils, when meeting them in corridors or recitation room, I have heard something nice about you, that it passed into a proverb in the school. Now I have determined that my mental attitude toward everybody shall be the same that these words indicate. The meeting is identical with that of the inscription on the fireplace in my den at home. Let something good be said. I remember mentioning to a literary friend that this was what I had chosen, and so far was here from perceiving my intention that he sarcastically remarked, are you then afraid that people will say dull things unless you set this rule before them? But my thought then was, as it is now, that we should apply in our discussion of people and things the rule laid down by Coleridge, namely, look for the good in everything that you behold and every person, but do not decline to see the defects if they are there and to refer to them. That is an excellent motto, brightly replied the other. But if we followed it, life would not be nearly so amusing as it is now. I have several friends whose rule is never to say any harm of anybody, and to my mind this cripples their development, for the tendency of such a method is to dull one's powers of discrimination. But, said the first speaker, would not a medium course be better? Such a one, for instance, as my motto suggests. This would not involve keeping silence about the faults of person and things, but would develop that cheerful atmosphere which helps to smooth the rough edges of life, and at the same time does not destroy the critical faculty, because you are to tell the truth and the whole truth concerning those around you, whereas the common custom is to speak much of defects and little or not at all of merits. Yes, was the reply, but it is not half so entertaining to speak of virtues as of faults, especially in this country. If you don't criticize, you can hardly talk at all, because the English dwell a great deal on what we in America call the salvage side of things. Have you then noticed this as a national peculiarity after 10 years of observation? Yes, and I have often heard it remarked, not only by our own countrymen, but by the people here. What do you think explains it? Well, I'm most inclined to apply the theory of M. Taine, the great French critic, to most of the circumstances of life. And I should say it was the climate, its uncertainty, its constant changes, the heaviness of the atmosphere, the amount of fog, the real stress and strain to live that results from trying physical conditions added to the razor sharp edge of business and social competition and the close contact that comes of packing 40 millions of people of pronounced individuality on an island no bigger than the state of Georgia. To my mind, the wonder is that they behave so well. Once, when I grew somewhat discouraged and said that I had made no progress for a day or two, my teacher told me that it was just so when she learned. There were growing days and stationary days, and she had always noticed that just after one of these last dull, depressing, dubious intervals, she seemed to get an uplift and went ahead better than ever. It was like a spurt in rowing. This seems to be the law of progress in everything we do. It moves along in a spiral rather than a perpendicular. We seem to be actually going out of the way, and yet it turns out that we are really moving upward all the time. One day when my most expert trainer twisted the truth a little that she might encourage me, I was reminded of an anecdote. In this practical age, an illustration of the workings of truthfulness will often help a child more than any amount of exhortation concerning the theory thereof. For instance, a father in that level-headed part of the United States, known as Out West, 
found that his little boy was falling into the habit of telling what was not true. So he said to him at the lunch table, Johnny, I will come around with a horse and carriage at four o'clock to take you and Mama for a drive this afternoon. The boy was in high spirits and watched for his father at the gate. But the hours passed until six o'clock when that worthy appeared walking up the street in the most unconcerned manner. And when Johnny, full of indignation and astonishment, asked him why he did not come as he had promised, the father said, Oh, my boy, I just took it into my head that I would tell you a lie about the matter, just as you have begun telling lies to me. The boy began to cry with a mingled disappointment and shame to think his father would do a thing like that. Whereupon the father took the little fellow on his knee and said, This has all been done to show you what mischief comes from telling what is not true. It spoils everybody's good time. If you cannot believe what I say, and I cannot believe what you say, and nobody can believe what anybody says, then the world cannot go on at all. It would have to stop as the old eight-day clock did the other day, making us all late to dinner. It is only because, as a rule, we can believe in one another's word that we are able to have homes, do business, and enjoy life. Whoever goes straight on telling the truth helps more by that than he could do in any other way to build up the world into a beautiful and happy place. And every time anybody tells what is not true, he helps to weaken everybody's confidence in everybody else and to spoil the good time not of himself alone, but of all those about him. So that's the end of this excerpt. Thank you so much for joining me and have a good week.